How are you? My name is Gunnar. I'm the uh, Vice President, General Manager of Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux at Red Hat. No need to applaud. Uh, let's see, all right. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard somebody, not you, somebody else, like a friend maybe, coworker, has said that the operating system is a commodity. Raise your hand if you've heard this. Raise your hand. All the way up. All right, every one of you see me after class. Because I know that when somebody said the operating system is a commodity, you didn't immediately say, no, 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 you're wrong. The operating system is a source of, of rich innovation in the open source community. Anybody say that? No? All right, that's why I'm here. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, why the rail guy cares so much about OpenShift and vice versa. Um, so let's get started here as I learn how this clicker works. Okay, first, uh, I'm going to show you, this is some secret special inside Red Hat information. This is the mission statement for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and I think it's important to start at level set is uh, nobody uses an operating system for fun. Try as I might, I can't convince somebody to run an operating system recreationally. So instead I have to give them a reason to run the operating system. And so it starts with this. You need to have a source of safe and reliable Linux innovation. And the reason why you need that is because you need something that is going to make your workload successful, ultimately. And if I just did that, and I only did it for like one Dell PowerEdge server, that would not be interesting. So instead, I have to do it for every conceivable piece of hardware that you've ever seen, and many pieces of hardware that, uh, that you've ever seen, and many that you have never seen. So across public clouds, at the edge, those PLCs that that gentleman in the back was talking about, Red Hat Enterprise Linux should be running on as many of these as possible in order to be as valuable, valuable as possible to you. Right? Um, and then finally, we actually serve two primary portfolios. First is the internal Red Hat portfolio, because a ton of Red Hat stuff runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Not a big surprise, but also because because we want to make workloads successful, we have thousands and thousands of ISVs that we work with. So you can think about the operating system. Its whole job is to be the thing in the middle. Uh, Michael Tiemann was once our vice president of open source affairs, and he liked to say, RHEL is the thing that stays the same so that everything else can be different. Because you have RHEL in the middle, that means you have your choice of thousands of pieces of hardware underneath and thousands of applications and things on top. All right, so with this in mind, I'm going to show you, this is kind of an architecture diagram of when we think about what RHEL is internally, this is kind of how we view it. Um, and it starts from the bottom with some obvious things, all of that infrastructure that I was talking about, physical, virtual, public clouds, et cetera, right? So what runs on top, what runs, what runs first, the most important, the most precious part of the operating system, it's the kernel, right? And uh, connected to the kernel, deeply connected to the kernel, are things like drivers, right? Uh, extremely fun stuff like systemd. Who loves systemd? Not enough of you raised your hands. Systemd is, is, a, is a precious jewel in the operating system. Um, you got stuff like SE Linux, namespace, C groups. By the way, all of these critical subsystems inside the core operating system that end up manifesting in OpenShift as stuff that you find extremely useful, right? All of that is actually deeply embedded in the, in the core of the operating system. Um, then move one layer up and you get to what we'll call the compatibility stuff. That's a technical term that we use here in the Red Hat uh, product management. Uh, the compatibility stuff, that's things like glibc and libgcc and pam and libxml2. It's all of those core pieces. If you take all those together, that is what makes a version number for RHEL, right? So when we talk about a RHEL version 7 or a RHEL version 8 or a RHEL version 9, we're not talking about the kernel. We're talking mostly about which version of GCC it is because it's that ABI compatibility, that binary interface compatibility that is what we're pegged on. And I'll talk more about what that ABI promise means in a second. So you've got a kernel, you've got an ABI, and then on top of that you've got, let's call it useful management stuff like uh, syslog and OpenSCAP and guest agents and all that, all that fun stuff, that you, the kind of thing that you put into a golden image or a core build uh, if you're running something in a data center. And then on top, you have all like the, you know, the fun runtime stuff. Um, now, uh, any guesses as to, uh, oh, so I'll start here. The core operating system of RHEL is about, let's call it 250 packages, right? It's about 250 pieces in the top. 
Any, any guesses as to how large Red Hat Enterprise Linux is in terms of number of packages today? Any guesses? Not one bad guess in this whole audience? 200? Insufficient. That was not a good guess. So uh, the actual answer is 13,000. There are 13,000 packages available in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That is not because an operating system requires 13,000 packages. Those, those 13,000 packages are shipped as part of RHEL because for 20 years, people say like, listen, Gunner, I appreciate you shipping that kernel that I love so much and that GCC that I love so much. If you could just ship this one package, if you ship it in RHEL, then I don't have to ask my security team to go certify it because it'll just come in as the Red Hat Enterprise Linux stuff. And you can take care of it and you can maintain it and you can fix the security on it. And if you just ship this one thing, then I'll be happy to standardize on RHEL. So do this for every customer for 20 years and you end up with 13,000 packages that you have to maintain for 10 years at a time. I'm hiring, by the way if you're interested. Uh, so, but, but, uh, but I think the, at first we resisted this, we wanted to make RHEL smaller, we were like, we're shipping too much stuff and people don't care anyway, like we need to shrink this down. But we finally, going back to the mission statement, we're a source for safe and reliable Linux innovation. And I think now we've learned to embrace the fact that people use Red Hat Enterprise Linux, not just for the 250 packages that constitute the Linux proper, but they use the RHEL subscription as a source for all of the other delicious 12,500 packages, right? Um, that can be safe and, and used, uh, uh, that can be reliable and, and used safely. Okay, so this was the world right up until Docker. And then Docker showed up. Oh, sorry, I, I, I stole my own thunder. I forgot I had this slide. Okay, let me tell you another story. 13,000 packages, right? Uh, raise your hand if you've ever built an operating system yourself. Like, I mean, literally type make and hit enter. Anyone? Nice, a respectable number on this side of the room. I salute you. All right, so if you built an operating system, you know that you know, it's, it's not necessarily fun, but pretty much anybody can build an operating system. Like, it's not that hard, actually. Once you get the, once you get the stuff, you can hit make and you, you make your options. You can go build the operating system. But anybody can do it. The trick is to do it exactly the same way for 10 years and update all 13,000 packages every six months, and then commit to supporting them for two years. So that's what all these kind of overlays look like. RHEL 7 is not just RHEL 7. It's RHEL 7.1 and 7.2 and 7.3 and 7.4 and 7.6 and pop, 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 all the way down to 7.8, 7.9. And any application that ran on 7.0 has to also be able to run on 7.9, even though 7.9 is fully 10 years later, for example, than 7.0, right? And you have to do it for RHEL 8. And you have to do it for RHEL 9. Any guesses as to the number of concurrent versions of RHEL we are running at any given time? Wild guesses. What was that? 15. Excellent. Between 15 and 17 versions, depending on the time of year, there are 15 to 17 concurrent versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux running at any given time, which means that every engineer who's, committing a, who's fixing a bug is fixing it 15 to 17 times across the entire museum of possible RELs. Right? It's a lot of work. Uh, OK, so the, and the idea here is that it, is, it has to stay consistent for a steady amount of time. Stay consistent in the major version, in the ABI sense, right? and also stay consistent on the minor versions over time. All right, now I get to tell the story about when Docker showed up. So we have this carefully curated thing of like all these different layers and we're managing all our life cycles and our CVs and everything's great and then Docker showed up and people suddenly got extremely cool downloading whatever off the internet and dropping it on top of our beautifully architected operating system. You can imagine how upsetting this was. Uh, and uh, what, people, what people appreciated about this was the ease with which they could install a container on an operating system, right? I could just download the container and I can go run it and then everything seems to work. Everything's just fine, right? The operating system surely must be a commodity. All right. So then, thanks in part to several of you in this room, uh, people started downloading lots of containers onto the operating system. And the aggregate effect of this is that every possible combination of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and container that runs on top of it is its own, that is its own support case. That is its own special thing. There is no bright line 
between the operating system and the container in the sense of, in the sense of support, in the sense of security, in the sense of reliability, in the sense of safety. This is when you drop a container on an operating system, it is not a fully enclosed thing. It is, a, it is literally an application on the OS. And in the same way that just downloading some random application down here and just expecting it to work on an operating system, you have the same constraint on the container side. Now, granted, a lot of, these, a lot of the challenges you're going to have are going to be corner cases, but it is not, uh, a container is not a free pass in terms of all of the combinatorics and the life cycle and the reliability and the maintenance and everything else. Make sense? OK. So what we did in partnership with our good friends from OpenShift is the first thing we did is we needed, a, we needed, a, we needed to create a boundary for ourselves, which was the like, let's just create a boundary around this operating system work where we can be sure that all the stuff inside it is going to work correctly, right? We're just going to kind of freeze it in place and make sure that we are carefully curating all the stuff inside so that you don't have to worry about it. And that was the idea behind CoreOS. The idea behind CoreOS was if we can have an atomically updated, consistent host on which you can run your stuff, then that frees you up from worrying about, uh, about all the combinations inside. And you can just worry about making sure that the container and the application that run on top of it are working correctly. Right? And it comes with the full faith and credit of the RHEL stability promise and the, and the, RHEL, and the RHEL compatibility promise. Um, likewise. Uh, UBI. Uh, who is using UBI? Raise your hand. Everybody, please raise your hand. OK. Uh, if you're using UBI, that's the universal base image. That is RHEL. That is us basically cutting out the kernel stuff, the actual OS stuff on the bottom, and creating that compatibility layer. And it's creating a, ba a container base image that constitutes that, compa that compatibility stuff layer, right? And allows you to, and it makes it easier to move that, uh, move that application around. OK, so together, CoreOS and UBI are a way of basically stitching the operating system promise back together. Make sense? All right, cool. Um, so OK, everything that I just talked about, and I gave you a, a, a very short summary of what could be an extremely complex process, and I could talk to you about the build process, and I could talk to you about all the, the QE and the CI that we do. Um, all of that hides inside this innocuous looking red banner at the bottom of this. And I fully recognize that the rest of, of the Kubernetes world and the rest of the OpenShift world is much, much larger. Right? It takes a lot to do a, uh, an application platform that is as, as all-encompassing as OpenShift is. Um, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux piece is just a tiny little piece, but you will notice that that tiny little piece is at the bottom of the stack. And if we don't get that part right, then everything else becomes much, much more difficult. Right? So. Uh, what I would like you to take away from this short brief on the history of Red Hat Enterprise Linux is, first of all, that it is what we are pursuing with RHEL. And the reason why OpenShift is so intimately connected to RHEL is not just because we're both working for the same company, but because um, OpenShift is heavily rel reliant on those subsystems that I was talking about, C groups, SE Linux, et cetera. It's heavily reliant on those, directly reliant on those. And to the extent that we can create a technically consistent platform and bring that same technical consistency that we have in the data center and we can bring it to container world, then that is supposed to be making your life easier. Uh, first through the development practices, right? If you, have, if you have a whole bunch of developers and they are deploying whatever containers on whatever operating system, that makes things extremely difficult. That makes it hard to figure out where, when things go wrong. So reducing the number of combinations and creating consistency should be making your developers more effective and but frankly avoids a lot of bike shedding, right? Second is uh, security. Again, reducing the number of variables, reducing the number, number of combinatorics should improve your security position. And the fact that you are basically free riding on all of the tens of thousands of people already running on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they need s bugs fixed and they need security fixed as well. And all that stuff accrues to CoreOS. Um, and then finally, uh, on the operation side, again, to the extent you can be consistent, you can make better use of the talent. Raise your hand if you have just the right number of administrators. Right. So for this reason, it is important to protect your talent and the skills and the talent that you have in the organization, right? And the only way to do that is through consistency and standardization in the infrastructure. Uh, because to the extent that you have snowflakes, to the extent you have corner cases, you are wasting, frankly, the talent that you have on a bunch of like 
all done a bunch of weird snowflake stuff, and oh yeah, that server actually behaves different than all these other ones, and these containers go to these ones, but not, don't go to these ones. To the extent you can get standardization, you can make better use of the talent that you have, because you don't have enough talent to manage a lot of this stuff. All right. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, how am I doing on time? I have a couple of minutes. I am ready for one question. Stump the OS guy. That's the game we'll play. Any questions? Not one. You are all fully informed. OK, now what's going to happen when somebody says, hey, man, uh, you know, the operating system's a commodity. What are you going to tell them? Absolutely right. Absolutely. Hey! <laughs> you see me after class. All right. Thank you for your time, everybody.